Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, a professor at the Stanford Doris School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm Ingrid Ackerman, an undergraduate in the School of Engineering. And we have with us here today uh, Professor Marshall Burt from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Welcome, Marshall. Hey, guys. Thanks a lot for having me. Good to be here. Absolutely. And uh, this last weekend, uh, uh, we were fortunate to have Marshall uh, and his uh, colleague, our colleague, uh, Solomon Shong, uh, who co-chaired a conference hosted by our Global Environmental Policy Department at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And we're really excited to have you here, uh, Marshall, to, to talk about the conference. Sure. And I want to start by thanking you all, really, for, for driving these conferences and being the organizing principle around which we could we have these amazing conferences. This one, to, to me, was a huge success. Uh, so the overarching principle is really thinking broadly about what we can do about climate change. And, and one way to think about it is there are two extremes. One is mitigation. We can fully get our act together. We can have seamless, cheap, cost-effective mitigation. Climate change goes away. Problem solved. Boom. That's on one end of the extreme. The other end of the extreme is we don't do anything. Suffering, right? We The world warms four or five degrees. People throughout the world, including here in California, suffer dramatically, right? Two ends of the extreme. We're not going to be on either one of those ends. We're going to be somewhere in between. But how close we are to suffering depends on uh, how well we can mitigate. And, and we are going to make some progress on mitigation. This is actually pretty well studied. It's not going to warm four degrees. It's likely going to warm maybe two degrees or two and a half degrees. But that's still a lot. That's a lot more warming than we've seen so far. So how do we avoid suffering? Well, sitting between mitigation and suffering is adaptation, is figuring out how we adapt to the warming that we're going to see. And so this conference was really organized around adaptation. We called it preparing for a changing climate, meaning the climate is changing and we need to prepare for it. We're not going to be able to fully mitigate our way out of this mess. So how are we going to adapt? And we brought together researchers who are really at the forefront of studying that, using historical data to understand how have we adapted in the past and what can that tell us about how we might adapt in the future? I'm curious how you study adaption. Do you mind discussing how the scientists at the conference presented their work? Was it mostly looking backwards in how we've adapted in the past or projecting expected changes into the future and modeling how we will have to adapt? Yeah, great question. Uh, it's really doing both. Uh, Often as social scientists, we want to try to learn from history. We're going to use data uh, you know, from California or from the U.S. or from different parts of the world to understand how human behavior, human choices have changed in the past in response to climatic change. And I want to highlight that we've already seen a lot of climatic change. Uh, so we might be expecting two to three degrees Celsius total warming from climate change, as I mentioned. We've already seen almost a degree and a half, right? So we have seen a lot of warming. And the question is, if we're going to adapt, then we should have already seen evidence of that adaptation. We've had a lot of opportunity to do so, right? And so our goal is then first to look backwards to study, okay, have we, have we availed ourselves of this opportunity? Have we actually been able to adapt individually, societally, uh, in the business world, right, in the, in the public sector? Um, and Well, what, what, what do you find on that? So... So our, our conference was organized exactly around this. And, and what we've seen so far in, in the academic literature and in the research community, I would say, is a dearth, a total lack of good empirical work on adaptation. Really, most of the attention has been on mitigation, and s much less has been on adaptation. This was then our effort to try to, among mainly among the economics community, but we also got political scientists and some data scientists who's doing good empirical work on adaptation, who can say something about how we have been adapting. Uh, and again, there aren't that many papers, and I think uh, this conference represented a lot of the new literature and a lot of the new excitement and young research energy that's going into this. Um, so what did we learn? Uh, I have at least a few sort of themes. So the way we organized the conference was loosely around different themes. So one is around migration, another is around coastal adaptation, um, one uh, session directly studied firms, so how are firms in various settings adapting? Some studied insurance markets, things like that. Um, so uh, let me start maybe on the firm side. 
Um, and here I would say there's both some some good news and then maybe some uh, some some less good news. Um, and and really, we shouldn't think of firms just acting in a vacuum. We should think of them as acting in the policy environment, right? And so, how do firms and and policy choices interact? So there was one nice paper that showed. Uh, so it turns out on, on really hot days or during heat waves, you get a lot of workplace injuries. People fall off ladders. They drive cars into things. They poke themselves with sharp objects, a lot of workplace injuries. And, and these are actually really well documented, and you can see substantial increases in workplace injuries on really hot days. OK, California recognized this and passed a law that said, OK, we need to take this seriously. Uh, and workers in exposed industries need to be given time uh, to take breaks when it's hot. You need to give them access to water, basically a chance to cool off, right? Uh, this law was passed in the mid-2000s, uh, and what the researchers were able to study is how this affected then firm behavior, right? And what they found is actually had a huge uh, impact, a huge benefit on really hot days. So the effect of a really hot day on workplace, workplace injuries went down substantially after this law, right? So, so firms responded to the regulation in a way that really improved worker safety uh, in California. Okay, so that's a good news bit. Uh, uh, maybe less good news, depending on your perspective, is the other thing that firms did is uh, is they actually started substituting capital for labor. They learned that labor, uh, humans, are sensitive to extreme heat in the way that machines are not. And so what you were able to observe after this regulation is many of these firms started to mechanize. They hired fewer workers and they put in more machines. Machines are less sensitive uh, to heat. So is that good or bad? That is a kind of firm adaptation. Uh, it is mechanization, right? And that has effects in the labor market that we might be worried about. That is so interesting. So you, and I can imagine generalizing that. If, you know, we think about the way that our companies organize as being in some ideal state, especially uh, folks in economics often think of that as a, but that ideal state looks like it might be different in a warming world. 100%. Uh, that's exactly right. Firms are going to have to adapt as well and sometimes have to adapt quickly. Uh, one other good example was uh, a very nice study of the insurance industry in California and how they're dealing with wildfires. So this is private insurers. Uh, and really what the study found is, is that insurers are really struggling to figure out how to price wildfire risk. So if you live in California or in the West, you know that wildfire risk is, is driven largely by a warming climate and is changing just dramatically. We've seen just in the last five years, remarkable uptick in wildfire activity. Okay, we think of insurance as a frontline adaptation measure or policy, right? We need to be able to insure ourselves against these disasters. The risk of wildfires changing so quickly that is very hard to price this risk. And so you find firms with wildly different models or expectations about what the prices should look like. And then a lot of firms that are really offering uh, policies at the wrong price, either too high a price and then no one can get insurance or too low a price and they're left holding the bag. Uh, so the insurance uh, industry around wildfire in California is really, I, th I would say right now, struggling to adapt to this rapidly changing climate. That's really incredible. I mean, because when you think about it, Cal as studying California, the, the good news there ought to be that we have uh, reasonably well-developed markets for uh, financial instruments uh, such as insurance. What does that mean for the, for the world? Of course, we see wildfire risk increasing worldwide because of climate change. Yeah, it's a great question. So to, to us, and, and again, going back to the conference, a couple of papers nicely highlighted the important role that the public sector can play in helping the private sector adapt. Uh, so one, uh, one area is in the role of information provision, so thinking about wildfires. Uh, the government has done this for a long time for floods, right? We provide flood maps. We tell insurance markets where floods are likely to happen and are not likely to happen. And these have been central in insuring floods for decades now in the U.S. We do not do that for, for fires, uh, and the government could. We could come up with a public model of fire risk, and that could help price insurance. We had two other papers in the conference that looked at the role of government forecasting, weather forecasting, and how beneficial that has been. So one really nice paper showed that improvements in forecasting dramatically reduced the number of car accidents uh, during the winter, right? So if you know a winter storm is coming, you can plan, you can reroute, you can go a different day, and and 
after these forecasts got really good, car accidents went went down dramatically. So again, highlighting the role of the public provision of information in improving individual decision making, firm decision making. What if we pivot to coastal engineering? I'm curious what the discussion was like in that regard, especially given how much sea level rise will influence um, the large population centers on coasts? Yeah, great question. So we had two excellent papers uh, thinking about flood risk, one in the coastal setting and one uh, sort of in an inland setting. Uh, Both of these have to do with governments making decisions about how much to invest in protection. So in the coastal setting, it's building seawalls. Along rivers, it's building levees. Uh, And these papers actually came to pretty different conclusions. So the coastal paper suggested that these investments actually look pretty good. You put up a seawall, you actually raise property prices. You can see property prices go up behind the seawall because people are rightly inferring that they're now protected. Uh, These don't help when you get the really, really bad Hurricane Sandys, right, the the terrible uh, hurricanes. But what they help a lot with is, is the smaller stuff that you get, the daytime flooding, the smaller floods. Uh, And so in a cost-benefit setting, the benefits seem to substantially exceed the costs uh, in these investments. The folks who were studying levees actually found the opposite. They found that, yeah, if you're behind the levee, that's really good. But what happens with the levee is you just push the water elsewhere, right? So you don't get flooding behind the levee, but you get flooding upstream, you get flooding downstream. And those negative spillovers actually outweigh the positive benefits once you accounted for the costs. Um, so the cost-benefit calculation, at least in that setting, looked looked pretty different. So I would say a mixed picture on the um, the effectiveness or the cost-effectiveness of these government interventions. So far, it seems like the the main lens taken at the conference was purely economic. Um, I'm wondering if there's any in- interdisciplinary analysis of some of these different levers that we can use to adapt to, adapt to climate change. Um, for example, seawalls. Um, there's an example close by in the Bay where I know a seawall has been proposed in a really wealthy community, um, but there's a lower income community right next door where the water will be diverted to. Um, And of course, it's an economic problem, but it's a bit broader than that. Was there any discussion along these lines? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, So uh, speaking as an economist, often we only invite economists to our conference, but we were we tried to be careful here. We invited some political scientists and I would say there and actually we invited uh, some political scientists. We had an amazing lunch talk from a legal scholar who talked about climate litigation and how the sort of empirical work that was being presented at our conference could be useful for climate litigation, which actually comes back to a lot of these environmental justice questions that you're talking about. Some of these are now being litigated in courts. And often they really just don't have the empirical evidence to support litigation. And uh, we had uh, Jessica Wentz from Columbia who, who really sort of laid out the sort of evidence they need to pass muster in courts and, and make these sort of uh, lawsuits um, successful. We also had political scientists. Uh, I, th- I would say one of the most interesting talks was uh, a lot of what political scientists do, as you know, is or, or some of them survey public opinion on different things. Um, So we have a lot of uh, survey evidence from the US on how people think about climate change. We have very little evidence from other parts of the world. And so they presented for the first time this data set they put together looking at uh, climate attitudes towards both mitigation and adaptation in many of the poor low-lying parts of the world, which was totally fascinating. Oh, I'm interested to to read that one. uh, And back on this issue of the lawsuits, uh, if I understand right, the importance of these lawsuits is not only to uh, uh, settle a particular case in a way that would be more fair for the victims, but then also to change the risk calculations for future decisions. And uh, was there much discussion of that? Uh, there was in, in Jessica's talk. Uh, these Many of these cases are still quite new and are working their way through the courts right now. Um, She highlighted again uh, how, not flimsy, but how, uh, I would say, not fully worked out the evidence bases on making these links. So Marin County sues ExxonMobil for damages from climate change, from sea level rise that they're going to have to adapt to, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we directly link ExxonMobil and the emissions from ExxonMobil and and the, you know, all the oil they dug up and then sold to us, right, that we put in our cars, So how do we link that to damages suffered by Marin County? So this is a question broadly linked to the the broader discussion of loss and damage. So what is the responsibility of large emitters or emitting countries to places where damage has occurred? 
we had actually hoped to get many more papers on that in this conference, uh, and we didn't. It, it's such a new and emerging area of research that actually we, we sort of lack the empirical evidence. So we would love to rerun this conference in a year and get a lot of papers on exactly that topic. They just don't yet exist. Well, absolutely. Uh, we'll be looking forward to you rerunning it in, in, a, in a year, uh, Marshall. I wanted to follow up on that uh, uh, new and unusual research you mentioned regarding public opinion about climate change around the world. Is the rest of the world as polarized as the United States appears to be? The rest of the world, at least from the evidence that we saw, and this was presented by Matt O'Mildenberger at UCSB, um, the rest of the world seems uh, less polarized. So their data collection was focused largely on lower middle income islands and low lying areas that were likely to be immediately under threat from climate change. Uh, and, and the focus there is is less on mitigation. These folks did not cause the problem, so they're not polarized about mitigation at all. They rightly blame most of the wealthy world for the emissions. It was really about adaptation and, and, and what funding to adaptation should look like, and should it be managed by local communities or local governments, or should it be managed by external actors? One of the most fascinating things uh, to me from these findings was uh, dramatic support for adaptation money, number one, to be large, which is important, but number two, to not be managed by local entities. A lot of these people were distrustful of their own communities or own governments in terms of being able to make good investments in adaptation. They wanted these to be managed by international institutions, the external community. So they wanted the money to come in, but they wanted to be, it to be managed uh, from what they thought to be it was, uh, you know, uh, responsible actors external to their own country, which to me was actually pretty surprising. That's interesting. This past summer, I did research in Palau and conducted a, a lot of social interviews regarding uh, climate change adaptation and if people would trust the government to handle funds coming in to address climate change um, and definitely notice some of those same themes. Okay, yeah, then fully consistent with what Matto showed. Uh, it, it wasn't universal. Some wanted local control, but others, I think, yeah, w wanted the, the rigor, what they perceived to be the rigor of external control. Yeah, I found a, somewhat of distrust in the government for handling the funds, um, but definitely the, the local communities would want to be involved in the adaptation plans um, because at the end of the day, it is their land, um, their water, their... Um, environment that will be impacted by by these challenges. That sounds exactly right. I think that's highly consistent with what Matto presented in the conference. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, Marshall, we're going to bring it to a close, but uh, before we do, any other reflections on the conference? It was really exciting for Saul and I to see the amount of excitement in this area on the research front. This is still sort of a research frontier. Again, as compared to studying climate mitigation, we know a lot less about adaptation the point of this conference was to try to bring together folks who are looking at it. And again, if we can run it in the future, we can then sort of endogenously promote research in this area. You know, having Stanford as a leader in this area, I think would be really great. A lot of young research talent really excited on these questions. And so to me, the, the conference was really, uh, really energizing. We absolutely will run this one again next year. Marshall, thanks so much for your good work. Thank you, Ingrid. And to all of you listening, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.